So welcome everyone to the this evening's presentation. We're really looking forward to hearing about the uh, the use of technology and uh, in innovative uh, immigrant uh, services systems. Um, before we get started, I'll just to uh, give a little bit of background on the, uh, the the two meetup groups that are that are hosting this evening. Uh, so the first is uh, Civic Tech Calgary. So um, we're all about uh, we're the use of technology for public good and really deal with uh, technology, data, and design uh, to address some of the challenges that uh, citizens and governments are facing, um, as well as to pursue opportunities for greater uh, citizen engagement and more uh, effective services. So uh, we really pulled together uh, uh, across Calgary, across these uh, various dimensions, um, citizens and civil society and various uh, community challenges, uh, government and the public sector and uh, digital services. So we really are an innovation space and we work through projects. So any ideas you have on uh, projects you wanna launch uh, to help make Calgary a better place, uh, just let us know and uh, we'll uh, launch those uh, projects. So we've been around since 2017, um, 770 plus members and growing. Uh, we typically have our meetups on the second Tuesday of the month. Um, and uh, you can sign up at, uh, through meetup uh, at Civic Tech uh, YYC. And there's our website, uh, as well as our, uh, our, twiddle handle, our Twitter handle. So this is a joint meetup with uh, Data for Good, uh, Data for Good Calgary. Uh, data for Good Calgary, we're a group of uh, data analysts, uh, data scientists, anybody that has a passion of data, passion for data and wanna use those skill set uh, for good. So what we do is we help uh, nonprofit and social organizations uh, harness the power of data to leverage their impact uh, in the community. Um, we're actually a chapter of uh, uh, national data for good organizations with uh, nine chapters across Canada. Uh, it's a, a great organization and engaging many, many uh, volunteers and nonprofits and, and events. So in Calgary, we've been going since uh, 2013, approaching uh, 2,000 members now. So we like to go over the uh, 2000 mark by the end of the year. So let's try to spread the word and make that happen. Um, we run a number of different types of events. So we have these major events called uh, datathons, uh, which when we met face to face were a Friday night, all day Saturday and a Sunday morning, uh, partnered with large organizations like the Distress Center, the Women's Emergency Shelter, Calgary Foundation, Calgary Arts Development. Uh, this year we're partnered with the uh, Calgary Homeless Foundation. Um, and we've been working with them and we hope that uh, sometime next year, um, we'll either have a virtual or a face-to-face -face datathon with uh, the Calgary Homeless Foundation. Uh, but we also have smaller projects that we, uh, and we have you know, two or three going at any one time. Um, um, so working with uh, uh, smaller organizations with maybe a bit less data, but a bit more focused. And we get volunteers who will uh, uh, come to us and want to help out, and then we'll work with that organization. So uh, you'll hear tonight about an opportunity uh, to work with, uh, with Hyder and Daniel at, uh, uh, on the, um, the uh, immigrant systems uh, uh, solutions as well. So stay tuned for that. Uh, we have meetups as well on monthly on the fourth Thursday of the month. So put that in your calendar as well. We're organized through meetup and our uh, Twitter handle um, and, our, uh, and our website there um, as well. So without uh, further ado, I will uh, stop sharing here and uh, I'd like to, uh, to introduce our, our guest speakers, and, uh, Heider and, uh, and Daniel, and I'll let them uh, 
introduce themselves. We're, we're thrilled to have them from um, Immigrant Services Calgary, you know, an organization that has been doing great things over many years in Calgary and, and really helping uh, newcomers and immigrants to, to really get settled and to uh, live out their potential uh, in, in Calgary um, and in Canada. So they've done some really cool things with technology and we're looking forward to uh, hearing all about that. So, uh, Hader, Daniel, take it away. Well, thank you so much, Jeff, to all of you that joined today. It's a pleasure for us to be here and talk about some of the innovations that are happening in the social sector. And what we are proud of is that Calgary is leading the way again nationally, because today we'll talk to you about the Gateway Project that's unleashing the economic, social, and civic potential of our community. And a little bit about me, my name is Haider Hassan. I currently work at Immigrant Services Calgary as their CEO. I joined almost a year and a half ago, but I'm an oddball CEO. I've spent 15 years in financial roles. I was the head of wealth management for Qtrade. I have set up a nonprofit in Eastern Africa focusing on maternal health. I've been a community volunteer through Rotary and I believe in the power of service above self. And um, the reason why I joined Immigrant Services Calgary is because I'm an immigrant myself. My parents and myself became to the country in 1999. My dad was an engineer working in the States, in Venezuela, in China, as a metallurgical engineer. And when we came to the country, I was in grade nine at that point. And I remember my dad saying to us at a dinner meeting, a dinner uh, event, that he did not have quote unquote a Canadian experience to be an engineer in Canada. And we were all really puzzled by that because you know, he had set up plants even in Finland and so on and so forth. And all of a sudden he was made redundant. And I think the reason why I share that story with you is because that probably shifted my focus when I was given the opportunity to lead this organization. I said yes to that, to making a change so that newcomers in the future could be, would not have to go through that. So I'll turn it over to my, uh, the star of tonight, Daniel Wu, who was, uh, when we talk about innovation in, in Calgary, he is a prime example of why Calgary continues to be world-class in attracting and retaining newcomer talent. So over to you, Daniel, talk about a little bit about what you're doing and, and where you come from. Thank you, Heidi. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Daniel Wu. I'm the team lead at Immigrant Services Calgary. I've been uh, working closely with uh, newcomers uh, for the last seven years. And myself, I actually, I'm a newcomer to, to, uh, to, to Canada. Um, and I come from China. Uh, my background is um, a computer, I have a computer science background. I studied in Europe. Uh, for, I lived there for seven years as well. Um, I speak German. Uh, so I don't know if in the audience group, uh, is anyone um, has the uh, German background. Um, and uh, I'm a nerd, but I have a lot of hobbies. <laughs> I like sports and enjoy running, hiking, and uh, also I really like uh, traveling. Um, and I've been invited into different national conferences as a keynote speaker. And uh, for this Friday, Friday, I'll be also invited to the, the next the National Metropolis uh, Conference uh, to deliver a uh, presentation to share our best practices of using technology to help newcomers to settle down in Canada. All right, thank you for that, Daniel. And what we'll do is, as, as Jeff said, I think he'll be setting up the question and answers and feel free to ask any questions throughout the presentation and we'll be happy to answer them and we'll look at Jeff for the queue. Now let's talk about what we're here to learn about is the innovation space. And, and you might be wondering, well, how can a nonprofit innovate? And uh, let, me, let me start off the presentation by giving some, some context. And the context is as follows. How we define innovation at Immigrant Services Calgary is that we like to try new things to drive forward towards a positive change for newcomers so that we can increase the public value for newcomers. And we do this through a deliberate process. And today, some of the innovations that we'll actually uh, share with you, we believe in the fail fast forward methodology. And through that methodology, we created some really phenomenal things. So, Without further ado, let me walk you through the, a few of the topics that we'll be talking about today. 
first of all, who we are as Immigrant Services Gallery and some of the things that we're doing. Some of the sector challenges we've diagnosed and the new federal immigration plan and how that actually helps us unleash our potential. And then the project gateway, which is the innovation that is coming out from Calgary that could become a practice that could be adopted by other civil society groups. So as the uh, CEO, uh, we set the innovation at the governance level. That's my point number one today. An organization cannot be primed for innovation if we are not supported from the top, which is the board of directors. So I'm really happy to announce that we, as part of our strategic plan, these are four strategic pillars. So enhancing strategic collaboration. This meetup tonight is an example of that. Um, we will do the call to action to see if there's any of uh, some of you actually want to join us on the gateway journey uh, to do some really phenomenal things. Uh, so that is open for you. The second one is sharpening our program focus. Are we doing the right things that can make us world-class? Number three is, are we investing in innovation and do we have a process of innovation? And finally, are we optimizing our human capacity and capability? So on that note, I'll turn it over to Daniel, who's going to walk you through some of the innovations that we discovered. But before Daniel does that, I wanna set a, um, the tone for us in terms of you know, we can be innovation, innovation oriented on paper until a crisis happened. And for us, it was the pandemic. So if we didn't have Daniel and Jeff on our team, and Jeff is our, he's actually on the call today and he's our chief operating officer. And uh, without that human capacity, we wouldn't have completely morphed into a virtual environment within one day. As soon as the pandemic hit, Within one day, we were set up virtually offering social services, onboarding newcomers in the virtual environment. So, so with that caveat, I will hand it over to Daniel who will walk you through some of the things that he's been accomplished, accomplishing over the past few months. Go ahead, Daniel. Thank you, Haider. So due to the pandemic, actually, um, the government found out the Canadians spend more time online. Uh, I don't know if you uh, noticed that yesterday, the, the federal government made an announcement to connect uh, to connect 98% of Canadians to high-speed internet by 2026. So they also mentioned about the good, reliable internet isn't, isn't a luxury, it is a basic service. Actually, this basic service opens a lot of doors for innovation, for, for us to develop different uh, projects um, to provide services to newcomers. Here are some examples we, want to, uh, we just want to share with you. The first one is the Welcome to Alberta is a mobile app. Actually, it's a, the first mobile app in Alberta to help newcomers to settle down in Canada. The second one is settlementcalgary.com. Also, is the first online portal in Alberta to provide settlement information for newcomers. The third one is online language assessment. So our organization, actually, we are the only um, language assessment center in, for, uh, for Calgary. So when pandemic happened, we move all those language assessment uh, online. We also the one of the first organizations in Canada have the capacity to do online language assessment. And the fourth piece is uh, new data analytics methods. So in the next couple of slides, we're going to share with you how we use data, uh, the data we are collecting to help us to improve our service delivery and to learn the data from, uh, to learn from the data we are collecting. And all those uh, uh, online counseling sessions, settlement, or as well as employment sessions, all of those uh, sessions are online now, including our workshops. And also we're providing online mentorships to newcomers. And we have an online job board for newcomers. Um, and those are real jobs for newcomers. And the next one is very popular is online citizenship quiz. So those for permanent residents, when they become, when, if they want to become a Canadian citizens, they will have to pass the citizenship knowledge test. We are the only organization in Alberta have that capacity to provide online citizenship quiz. The next one is um, appointment booking. So the newcomers, they can select what time, what day, what language they speak. Because we, put, we have first language speak counselors at our organization. And the next one is virtual career fair. Actually, it's going to be happen next week, uh, November 18th and 19th. So in this picture, you might see this other beautiful category uh, in the background and you can see different companies that are participating 
And uh, the, the screenshot is from last, uh, the, the last one. Uh, you can see Amazon, YMCA, Shell, all those companies are participating. It's an online event and it's free for newcomers, for people to participate online. And very excited and uh, uh, to introduce the, uh, like uh, tonight about uh, the Welcome to Alberta app. As I mentioned before, the app is the first mobile app uh, like um, um, in Alberta. So when we launched the app, we received lots of uh, national media coverage. For example, Toronto Star, CBC, Metro, uh, Metro News. Even, I don't know if uh, like, uh, you, are, you are very like uh, is an Apple person, the iPhone in Canada, uh, they also promote our app when we launched the app. Um, so the app has uh, provided overview of Canada as well as Alberta. Um, we provide information, uh, reliable information about important documents, the PR card, passport, housing, healthcare, finances, employment, education, you name it. So all those uh, relate, like, uh, important information related to newcomers, they can find on this mobile app. And also there's a unique feature uh, embedded into this mobile app we have three preloaded customizable to-do lists uh, with milestones and checking points to facilitate newcomers settlement and integration. We have three to-do lists. One is, one is for people before they come to Canada. The second one is uh, two weeks after landing in Canada and another one is three uh, months after landing in Canada because at a different stage, they have different things. We want to remind them, oh, so when you first come to Canada, you, you should have your healthcare card ready. You should open your bank account, or how do you help your kids to find a, a school for them? So all those information they can find in this app. And uh, um, as we mentioned before, the, during the pandemic, we find a way how, how do we look at the data we are collecting and uh, how we learn for the data. So this is a dashboard we build with uh, Microsoft Power BI based on data we are collecting. So you can see from April to October, how many newcomers come to our organization and uh, for which zone, and also how many of them actually, uh, they're outside of Calgary. So because of online, because of, uh, for example, the uh, using Zoom, Microsoft meeting, uh, um, Microsoft Teams, we can provide online counseling sessions to connect those newcomers outside of Calgary. And uh, there's a huge number, you see there's 10K, like 10,000 uh, workshop participants, which is amazing. And uh, when we compare of the, the number of workshops, like 268 workshops, but we have over 10,000 participants. And also in this uh, um, dashboard, you can see about 40% of newcomers come to our organization are uh, uh, independent economic class. Around 30% of them are family sponsored and around another 30% of them are refugee classes. And on the, on the right hand side, you can find out what kind of services uh, they're looking for. For example, uh, over 23% of them are looking for financial assistance. 23% of them are looking for education or skill development programs. And also 16% of them, they're looking for uh, employment services. So all those information we are collecting actually help us to understand newcomers better to address our, to adjust our service delivery. And uh, this one shows us the top countries of origin. So the top countries um, you can see on, on the right hand side, on the, sorry, on the left hand side, also the world map really excited actually every time i open uh, this dashboard really blow my mind like our organization we really save the the people around the world so those newcomers they bring the culture the knowledge to to canada society we also really appreciate them and this the next one on the uh, left hand side is the heat map actually really shows the physical locations of uh, newcomers. You can see newcomers, they live everywhere in, Ca in Calgary. And uh, this heat map, if you see the, darker, the, the color, the, the, the greener, which means there are more newcomers that live in that community. So for us, actually this heat map, we, we use this heat map to open some satellite offices. So to provide 
uh, targeted settlement services in the community. And uh, on the right hand side, um, when you first time look at the map, uh, this uh, graphic, you might think it's an alien uh, because it looks so complicated, but actually it's really helpful for us. Um, so, for example, um, when we look at the independent economic class, actually you can find the train and what kind of services are looking for. The first one, actually, they're looking for education. They're looking for um, em emotional support. They're looking for employment. They're looking for finance. How, uh, how about uh, family sponsored? Same thing. Actually, when we look using the power of BI is interactive, like uh, um, the graphic. So every time when we open this, we can identify for what a kind, what immigration category, what kind of services they were looking for. So we can provide targeted like a settlement services to them, and really helps us a lot to understand the needs. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Daniel, for that. So, you know, key points that we learned from Daniel. Number one, innovation is a process. So most innovation journeys move through three phases of problem and definition, right? You go through the uh, designing what, what the problem statement is. Then you go into solution exploration. And then the third one, the most important one is, is testing, iterative testing. So this dashboard, Daniel and Jeff, our CEO, they were testing it. They were, you know, getting feedback. Uh, there was policy makers involved. There was civil society groups involved. There was tech groups involved, just like you. I did a couple of hackathons with a couple of groups and, and, and here we are today. What I'm really proud to announce is that this dashboard that Daniel has built is now informing federal government policymakers. And they're actually using our data set to make uh, critical decisions on the future of our country. So, um, so I'm really proud of that. And as we're talking about innovation, naturally we talk about scaling. And in order to scale, there's dimensions of transformation that need to happen. And that transformation is currently happening, happening at Immigrant Services Gallery with our own team. That was also happening through the Gateway Project that I'll talk about a little bit later. And then finally, that transformation also needs to happen in the community because our dream is that we attract the best of the best to Calgary and we offer them the welcome wagon culture. For those of you who are Calgarians for a long time, you will know that this is something that was uh, heavily uh, embedded in the culture where anytime a newcomer or someone that would move into the neighborhood, um, a welcome kit would be produced and a welcome wagon would go around welcoming the new neighbors. So we want to bring the welcome wagon 2.0 through the gateway program and through data sets and use of that. So thank you again for that, Daniel. A Couple of statistics for, for you. Uh, Daniel mentioned language assessments and so on and so forth. You must be wondering, okay, what, are, what exactly do we do? Well, what we do is think about the last time you onboarded yourself to an organization uh, or if you had a, your own startup, you probably went through HR and an onboarding process for the first 90 days. And so that's the same thing we we're offering for a newcomer that comes to our country. Imagine if the onboarding was done pre-arrival through the gateway planning. A plan was set in place as soon as you land at the airport, you know where you're going to live, you know where you're going to be working, you know where your kids are going to go to school. I'll present a story for you. Um, I, I met a newcomer. He's a, he came through the startup visa program under the economic immigration stream. And I sat down with him for coffee and asked him, what do you want to do, Neeraj? And he's, 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 got, he's, got, he's got a successful exit from California. And his dream is to actually create startups in Calgary. And you know what his answer was? He said, Hyder, I wish I knew about the driver's license process for my wife because I would have actually gotten the driver's license from India, but now my wife has to wait one year. I'm driving our twin daughters to school and I'm taking Ubers everywhere. So imagine that integration, right? You're moving into the new country and now you can't even drive. Very simple, you may think, but that's where the gateway thinking comes in. And with innovation, as you know, you don't have to create new inventions all the time. It's all about iteration, how we can create a step change. So as you can see from this data set, you know, we've served multiple um, 
uh, we've got almost like 36,000 plus uh, well, um, hours of volunteer time, 1,735 volunteers on our Rolodex. We're hoping that you would actually join us and the call to action, I'll turn it over to Daniel to make the call to action on what we need to make gateway scalable. So Daniel, without further ado, if you can please describe what we're looking for. Um, yes, like uh, as Jeff also mentioned about like uh, at the beginning, he, he mentioned about like uh, you're constantly uh, looking for new projects. Same thing, we're, uh, I see we're constantly looking for new projects as new talents as well, like you today. Um, at the moment, we're looking for uh, people who have Salesforce, for example, experience, Salesforce administrator or Salesforce developer. And also we're looking for people who has um, data analytics background, as well as uh, people who are very passionate about uh, app developer, uh, app development. So if you have those uh, skill sets, or if you have any, uh, thing, uh, any uh, new projects, ideas, you can also uh, feel free to reach out to us. Uh, and we, as a mentioned here we have lots of volunteers at ISD and uh, they contribute uh, lots of volunteer hours thank you very much thanks Daniel so okay what are the challenges that we're facing so if you're a newcomer think about the last time you went to a foreign country you you bought, probably ordered coffee or you're you're walking out at the airport and you're going through that experience of ordering coffee and that stress that you felt the writing was in a different language. You know, you were probably looking at your phone apps to do some translations, and you're hoping that the other person speaks English, right? So unfortunately, we're not in an in-person environment. Every time uh, when we ask this question in group settings, literally 90% of the hands go up. Oh yeah, yeah I, I felt that stress higher. You're right. So that's what a newcomer is feeling, magnified a hundred times because now they're bringing they're burning all their ships, so to speak, coming to Canada to unleash their economic, civic, and social potential. All right, so you may ask, well, what happens next? So Immigrant Services provides language testing. Why do we provide that? Because how can I be your friend if I can't speak the language? And being a friend sounds simple, but if the community welcomes newcomers from all around the world, you know, Calgary takes leadership with diversity, equity, and inclusion. How beautiful of a city would we be if we do that? So the language assessment places the newcomers on a benchmark score of one to 10. Based on the benchmark score, we refer them to a language school for free English language training. Now, guess what? Only 30% of newcomers are aware of this free service. So, what we're trying to do is through gateway program, we are trying to increase that to 80% of uptake. And that's the point in the middle here that immigrants are unaware that our resources exist. So we're currently looking at expanding that through civil society groups, through tech groups like this, and through private partnerships to spread the word. The one on the left is lack of coordination. So what happens is that right now, uh, there, there are, based on our analysis, 5,000 groups in Calgary that do some sort of newcomer settlement. Isn't that a cool thing? And, and you know, those 5,000 groups, I'm talking about uh, places of worship, schools, coffee shops, neighbors, uh, community centers, the zoo. Like, I can give you, like, so many names, but there's no standardized process to onboard and create a newcomer plan. As Daniel was mentioning, the Welcome to Alberta app and the to-do list is the first step of that process. And thanks to Daniel's efforts, we are now seeing people from outside of the province downloading the app, creating their to-do list. Okay, and the final one is the lack of data sets. So you saw the iteration there that we're taking some leadership in ensuring that we've got the right data set. How does that help us? I'll give you an example. This is from the minister himself of labor and immigration. He said to me a few months ago in a conversation, he said, Hyder, there's a shortage of chemical engineers in Alberta right now. Now, guess what? Two, three years ago, we had an oversupply of engineers. By the time we onboard a newcomer, by the time we source the newcomer through the immigration program, the point system that we have, by the way, is cited as the world's best example. Um, our federal immigration minister was invited by Chancellor Merkel from Germany to learn from the Canadian immigration system and how we're doing it. But there is that lag, 
of that three years. So now we have a shortage, but all the chemical engineers have left the province. Actually, one of them is actually one of my friends who moved to Boston and took a job there. So let's move on to the federal immigration program. So in the pandemic, now that you know a little bit about what we do, uh, I talked about language assessment. The second thing we do is we help unleash the economic potential. So if a newcomer has an idea for a business, we will set them up for success. There's some studies out there from the Business Development Bank of Canada that says that newcomers in the first five years have a high probability of creating a new enterprise that can actually be a net new creator of jobs. What I love about that stat, that statistic, oh, tongue twister statistic, is that after five years, they will become Canadians. So Canada becomes better because we're unleashing that potential. The second thing is we, uh, for example, lawyers and any professions, we've got, I mean, Calgary is again leading. There's many internationally trained lawyers that are coming to the city and are, that are actually getting qualified and, and unleashing their potential. One of the notable ones recently is a young man by the name of Charles Osoji, Osoji and Smith. He became uh, a fast, he went to the fast track program, became a lawyer and ended up buying a stake in a law firm. And, uh, what I like about that story, his name is Osoji, which is a Nigerian name. He was under pressure to, to not put his name on the, on the law firm. So people said, why don't you use a Canadian name or some sort of other name? And he actually defended his heritage and said, no, it's, it's going to be Osoji and Smith. And uh, he was also the recipient of our Immigrants of Distinction Awards just a few weeks ago under the category of young professionals under the age of 35. So think about that, right? And Charles Osoji, if you follow him on, on LinkedIn right now, he's hired multiple lawyers, both newcomers and Canadians in the pandemic. He continues to hire, and, and that's again, it's a very small story, I have many for you, but in the interest of time, I'll just give you a little bit of stories here and there. Okay, so you must be wondering, well, why is the federal government increasing immigration while we have the pandemic? And what's in it for Canada? I'll, I'll try to, um, do some myth busting here. So number one, because of the pandemic, we haven't seen the influx of Canadians that we would have seen because as you know, the borders are closed. There's a lot of restrictions on travel. So this plan, by the way, is a record plan, 401,000 immigrants. The last time this happened was in 1913. And so the benefit of this is that 60% of these newcomers, 240,000 of them will be economic class immigrants, meaning net new job creators. Um, the fact that we have a declining birth rate and the fact that we have an aging population, the only way to fill the void, and I'm talking 10, 20 years from now, in 2040, the healthcare costs will be funded by the newcomers that we onboard today successfully. So hopefully that gives you a little bit of perspective on how we're, um, progressing forward and unleashing the potential. All right, on to Gateway. How is Gateway now relevant? So I'm gonna take an organizational view now. We talked about the sector view. We talked about what's not working. Okay, how about action bias? Our team is known for action bias. We will fail fast forward in a safe environment. And that's what makes our team really dynamic in the city. And uh, we did a lot of iterations here. And what we came up was with the Gateway concept through multiple stakeholder feedback. We looked at research, we, looked, we talked to multiple newcomers. And that 30% gap that I told you, only 30% newcomers are availing services, we want to increase that to 80%. Because new Canadians, newcomers need to know that we're here for them with the welcome wagon, that we're here for them to unleash their economic, social, and civic potential. So let's do a deep dive into Gateway. It starts with a plan. The plan gives them the goals, the needs, and priorities. Now, legacy settlement services, they would call this the assessment plan. So if, if an economic immigrant comes into our office and we start saying things like, we need to assess you, um, they'll probably walk out the door really quickly because you know they've already been assessed on the point system. They have earned the right to be in, in the country, and now we are assessing them again. So we want to change that approach and we wanted to call it the plan which is the goal needs and priorities then we want to do a welcome package 
And the welcome package would probably include a welcome kit sponsored by community members, from private sector groups. For example, one of the pain points for newcomers is that they don't have a credit history when they come here. So we're in, in talks with two major telecommunication companies to see how they can actually sponsor some of the cell phones. We're in talks with some of the financial institutions on how to establish credit history even before arrival. So small things that, like that can really make an impact. We're talking to Uber, for example, to see if the first ride from the airport to their new home is complimentary, right? Based on the welcome wagon experience. Then we want to give referrals out based on the data set that you saw, because based on the needs, we can be iterative and be more focused, leading to the knowledge hub. And we're really proud of the fact that 30 plus agencies have come together to be part of our governance model. And for the advisory council for the Gateway Project, we've got the Dean of the Faculty of Social Work at the University of Calgary. We've got two other CEOs from civil society groups. And we've got the Calgary Local Immigration Partnership, which includes organizations like AHS, Calgary Police Services, all coming together to unleash the economic, social, and civic potential. So the first 12 months are essential because if we don't have a touch point in the first 12 months, then the integration process gets delayed. And then immigrants will say things like, well, I came to this country for my kids. So they'll stop believing in their potential and they'll say, you know what? I'm here to do kind of quote unquote survival jobs, Hyder. It's my kids that are gonna take the ball forward. And what we're saying is no, actually, you came to the country, we will also unleash your potential. So, you know, we talked about this, that immigrants actually do create more jobs because some, sometimes immigration is politicized, as you know, and uh, there's rhetoric on it, but the facts are that, you know, there, it is beneficial for the economy. Now, we looked at 1,000 1, immigrant families. Here's a number that's worth looking at they contribute over $20 million worth of taxes per year. Um, in terms of the pandemic right now, if it weren't for immigration, um, you know, more than 33% of uh, the professional scientific and technical services uh, employees are newcomers. 42% of accommodation and food service workers are immigrants. And uh, what I also like is engineers again, 47% are immigrants and more than 60% of transit and ground passenger transportation are immigrants. So if you look at just these stats, I mean, if we didn't have immigration, <laughs> we would not be able to take transit. We would probably not have, a, not have many restaurants. And most importantly, right now with the pandemic, the heroes, the frontline heroes that are taking us to the next level, we have the highest level of testing in Alberta, are again, immigrants playing a huge part. Nearly six out of every 10 workers in the sector for nursing, six out of 10 in nursing are immigrants and newcomers. So again, labor market growth has also come from immigrants and continues to, to, do, to do so. And we need your help, as Daniel said, on those three segments. And what I'll do is, before I finish off, I'll share a quick video with you, less than three minutes, and then we'll go into a question round to see if you have any questions. Yeah, so please put your uh, questions into the chat box and we'll uh, pass them along during the, the uh, Q&A. Gateway is a solution that's driven by community by Calgarians to ensure that Canada continues to be the best person in the world to live, work, and play. Right now, we are only seeing 30% of newcomers. Wouldn't that be great if Calgarians or Canadians, if we come up with a way to onboard new Canadians quicker, faster, so that they unleash their economic, social, and civic potential? The problem that we're trying to solve with our gateway transformation project is to enable newcomers to get better quality and easier access to services that already exist. There's a huge gap between services that are available and their utilization by our newcomers. At the heart of the gateway system is the creation of a standardized needs assessment and referral process for all newcomers that are coming to Calgary. 
The Gateway Project is a transformation not only to ISC but to the sector in which we will become at ISC the single point of entry or access into the newcomer serving agency world in Calgary. So essentially what that means is we're currently developing a needs assessment and we're standardizing that needs assessment to be able to provide that assessment across various locations in Calgary so we're all following the same standard. But the aim of that is to really improve the coordination of services between agencies so there's less replication of work, less duplication of efforts, increased efficiencies, and increased coordination. From the newcomer's perspective, they only have to tell their story once. Ultimately, it will reduce the number of hours that staff spend taking intake and doing that initial assessment when ultimately the, the client may not even stay with that agency throughout the course of their newcomer journey. Rather than being reactive as we're gathering data and information and understanding their stories a little bit better at the outset, we're better able to say, here's what we're seeing, here are some of the trends, here's what's coming across in the stories. And being able to create a model that not only sets up that initial assessment and referral, but one that follows them through as they start their life here in Canada. And we get a sense of how good of a job we're doing for newcomers that are coming to Canada, I will say this to you. You will succeed here. You will unleash your economic, social, and civic potential. If you have a family, they will be successful here. If you've got kids, they'll be the best version of themselves. That's a no-brainer. And the Gateway program will actually be the catalyst to help ensure that you get there faster. Fantastic. Thanks. Thanks so much. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Hader and uh, Daniel, for an uh, amazing presentation. You guys are doing great, uh, great stuff, and we really want to congratulate all that all that you're doing. And uh, it's really important uh, work as we go forward uh, for the uh, the uh, the new economy and our our society uh, in in Calgary. So again, if you have any questions, please uh, put them into the chat. We have a few coming in, so we'll, we'll cover those off. So um, firstly, though, just to, uh, um, if you are interested in, um, in volunteering uh, in some of the areas that, uh, that were mentioned, um, you know, we will uh, we'll certainly uh, um, want you to reach out uh, to us. So, uh, through Data for Good or through Civic Tech, uh, you can send a message uh, to me, uh, Jeff Zakabe, um, with your, uh, uh, your contact information, like an email. Uh, give a little bit of your background and, and some way that you would like to help out. Uh, we'll consolidate a kind of those list of volunteers and uh, form a little project team and then get together with Heider and uh, uh, Daniel to uh, kind of see how we how we move forward. So that would be the I think the most efficient way uh, for us to uh, uh, to help out on a on a go forward basis. And a lot of a lot of possibilities there, right? Whether it's an, data analytics or app development, or maybe have some Salesforce uh, background or database background. So um, and uh, even beyond those areas. Right, uh, uh, we like to have sort of integrated uh, projects teams with a lot of different types of experience like uh, project management and uh, design and communication. So please, uh, um, please uh, send me a note um, if, you are, uh, if you are interested. So a um, couple of the questions that have, um, that have come in. Um, you know, one is around um, like in this sector, right? It's I mean, it is a busy sector, right? You talked about you know five thousand organizations, you know, big and small. But I guess the question is around collaboration, right? And and how how are you able to uh, engage some of those organizations, maybe you know some of the big ones, especially, and kind of work together for the common good, right? As opposed to trying to be somewhat competitive or you know looking for your own niche that that uh, 
that you might want to pursue. So like what, what are the dynamics of the sector and how do you reduce some of those barriers to uh, collaboration? That's a really good question. And thanks again for the opportunity tonight. We believe in a, in a saying that we are here to complete, not compete. And we stick by that rule. And if you really believe in complete versus compete, then actually we are being client centric. And if you're being client centric, then any type of innovation that you do and you work on, then the ego is on the side. So I think I'm really proud of our dynamics here at the team. You even saw that in the video, there was like a circle in the middle, the client is in the middle, then there's referrals and data around the client. So I think that's how we maintain focus. In terms of uh, dealing with civil society agencies and collaborating, the strengths of civil society are that you can scale fast if you have client centricity in mind. But on the con, most of the civil society groups, this is again my newbie experience, I've been around for a year and a half, so please take it with a grain of salt. But what I've observed is that there, a lot of the processes are based on interpersonal relationships between the frontline staff and the clients. And when you actually do that, um, when you focus in on that, you're trying to scale that up, you can't because you will actually burn out the staff because you know, it's like you're trying to add more to the staff's plate. And what we think is that standardized needs assessment through the gateway program is a scalable solution. Imagine if all groups in Calgary were on the Salesforce system and had the Daniels app and we're onboarding newcomers through the app because the app has skip logic in it. It has, in the future, it'll be powered by AI. So if a client is saying things like, look, I need, I need to start a business. So, so no one is going to ask a client about creating a resume, right? So those are small things that we can do. The last thing I would like to say in terms of complete versus compete, it's always tough. It's always takes a lot of guts and, and bold thinking to collaborate with you may call uh, people who are not part of the coalition of the willing. But the ability to de-bias yourself, put your ego on the side and pick up the phone and call the detractor and say to the detractor that, you know what, you've got a good point, can we talk? There's some, there's some magic in that in civil society groups that I have certainly have benefited from. And it, if it weren't for those people who are not part of the coalition of the willing, the gateway iteration wouldn't have actually resulted in the scale that you see today. So those are a few reflections on that. Daniel, you, you've been watching this really closely as well. Any tips from you on collaboration that you would like to add or validate? Um, yes, hi, Ray. thanks. Um, actually, like uh, for us, we really believe like complete versus complete. Um, and um, also we during the meetings we um, like uh, with engaging our community partners we always show them um, so for example as Heidi mentioned about one of the example using the Salesforce system we have a standardized needs assessment actually the whole sector will be benefit from it and it's really client-centric approach so we work as a community like a whole family to provide services to 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 uh, newcomers rather than like a one, organ one organization provide the similar services to uh, different newcomers. When, they, when a newcomer come to another organization, they might be asked for the, the questions again. So um, just in that video you have seen, we really want to uh, minimize some duplications as well as uh, um, like to reduce that uh, barrier between um, the settlement uh, services and uh, the newcomers. Right, so that, that uh, sharing of data, I mean, is, is really key, right? And that, that, that's going to make a, a, a huge difference. That's correct. Is that, is that happening now or is that something that you're, you're trying to work towards? Actually, that's the one. So for that, we always say to agencies, we do, so Daniel is being humble and that's the problem when we do these public speaking engagements, we, I have to continuously like pump him up and say, look, Daniel, we show off a little bit. Uh, I think one of the things that he's worked on is the demo for the system and, and there's the, we have a collaboration actually with the YMC in Southwestern Ontario. How cool is that, right? It, it happened virtually just like this. We did a meetup and they were developing a Salesforce methodology and a system under their innovation stream. 
and this is, there's an innovation stream for the federal government where you can apply for it and then you test out projects and then you wait for the community to adopt them. So we became the adopters for their project. And, and so with that collaboration, actually we're leading by example, right? Because two agencies in different parts of the country are coming together to create some good synergies. And what we've seen for, for other agencies that have joined us is a rising tide lifts all boat all boats kind of analogy because as we are delivering on the need we're we are actually quantifying what the need is and the results that we're pr producing uh funders and government and private foundations donors are extremely receptive to that because they want to put their money where there's the biggest return on social investment especially during the pandemic as our resources are stretched right great so um there's a, there's a question and um, uh, it's pertinent in today's uh, situation. So it's, it says, um, we want to ask about uh, the platform, how's it faci uh, facilitate in terms of dealing with Canadian weather? Uh, so like the winter, I mean, is, uh, it must be a common issue, right? With some of the, the immigrants from warmer climates. Uh, what, oh, yes. what, 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 like what, what are they getting into, right? Yes, I think I'll turn it over to Daniel to, uh, to, to talk about the operation elements, but that has come up so many times. And you know, every time it comes up, we kind of laugh it off, right? Because, well, welcome to Canada. I mean, didn't you do Google it to see what Calgary's temperatures are like during the winter and even the snow in May and June sometimes. But I think that's where the planning piece comes in from the gateway because that simple thing, if we prepare, the newcomers that this is the weather system, please bring a jacket, please bring gloves, please buy a scarf. And to top it off, if, if you're not able to reach out to the newcomers in the welcome kit that I talked about, the welcome wagon, we will put a jacket in, we will get sponsorship from big brands to put in, you know, Canadian toque, for example, and, uh, and, and so on and so forth. So I'll turn it over to Daniel to see if there's, actually he's already put the settlement, he's very efficient. So go ahead, maybe talk about the settlement platform, Daniel. Um, yes, so that's a very good question, uh, Jeff. Thanks uh, for the person who asked uh, this question. Actually, on our settlementcalculator.com, the online platform, we have uh, like a how-to video project. And uh, one of the projects uh, is a video project. One, one of the um, video we did is how to prepare for winter in Alberta. Mm. So before you come, come to Canada, we do show them how to they survive in this uh, like a winter. So uh, teach them how to wear like a uh, clothes in layers. So actually, the, this uh, category.com, this online platform, the video I just we share with you in the chat is just uh, like a small example. In this uh, platform, you can find all those different aspective, uh, aspects of uh, living, um, daily living in in, Ca in Alberta, in Canada. So not only about how, uh, how to, uh, like, uh, to prepare in winter, also we have uh, tons of information and uh, updates every, uh, every day. Like every day we provide like uh, about six to five, uh, like six, seven updates. And um, I think the last week was a French, uh, like, a, um, like a month, um, oh, sorry, the French event. And uh, in our platform, we also publish uh, like a uh, update in French, just to welcome that French community. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, by the way, um, just I want to share with the, the audiences today. Um, over settlementcalculator.com, the platform we have is not a really. Um, well, we have a, we started like in 2015. So when we first started with uh, with a group of volunteers, and later on the platform has been growing. And until today, we have uh, uh, welcomed over 440,000 visitors. Wow, that's great. So you, you've done some amazing things with, you know, with technology. I guess uh, one question we have here is around um, how do you reach out to newcomers that aren't um, you know, technology savvy or don't you know, have access to technology or a computer or the internet or whatever? What, um, really, good. Yeah. really good question, Jeff. I think going back to our problem statement identification and the pandemic that became very clear to us that in the dashboard 
what you're not seeing are the vulnerable groups that don't have access to technology. So we actually came up with a solution where we uh, created a rapid response team and uh, we, we bought some iPads and, and simple, uh, simple use cell phones. When I say simple, it's not a smartphone. So someone who has a low literacy or is a senior that has, is not a, adept with technology, they can just, it's a press of a button kind of approach. Uh, so we, we stocked our inventory. And what we did was that we said, let's go to the home. So we shipped out these technology equipment to the vulnerable clients. And then our newcomer planners actually called that device to stay connected. Right. So I think that's, uh, I'm really proud of that because it's kind of like an innovation again. I know it sounds simple, but it's, I think the simple things that matter. So that question is, is really, really good one. The other thing that we've done is for low literacy clients, again, if we, you know, who can do even do the language assessment, we have actually created a protocol through our um, COO to offer in-person assessments for those vulnerable clients. So, so there's a approach there as well that we've thought of. And um, Daniel, any any insights from you on that? Yes, um, actually, this is a very good question. And also, when we de uh, develop those uh, like uh, innovative projects, we also uh, think about those uh, vulnerable groups. They may uh, not uh, tech savvy, but uh, like um, one of the things I can share with you during the pandemic when it happened, we move all those services online, and also we don't want to leave those clients or seniors uh, behind the services. And what we did, we, we developed about 10 videos, for example, to teach them how to use Zoom meeting, how to uh, participate uh, like uh, online workshops at our, our organization. And uh, um, maybe, you, you, maybe you could not believe that we have uh, the biggest uh, like a senior program. All those seniors, they are all with us. They are doing yoga classes. They are learning uh, language. They are doing paintings and uh, they have uh, cooking classes online. So sometimes we're thinking oh, maybe seniors will be difficult uh, to using technology nowadays. But actually, they're not. They are not. They're learning so fast nowadays. And uh, every time when they're showing us the cookie, the cooking or paintings, they look so happy. Even today, I know that they had uh, like uh, uh, emotion like uh, support groups also online. So really, like um, technology on part uh, on one side, yes, it's really sometimes it's difficult for people. Um, not that have doesn't have a lots of uh, technology uh, background, but uh, actually it's a learning process. Our life is a learning process. Um, like they can benefit from it as well. Yeah, and just to conclude what Daniel is saying, internally we use the term adaptive leadership, and what that means is it's not technical leadership. Technical leadership would mean, for example, to solve this challenge and the question Jeff that the attendee asked was. Uh, we would just come up with, well, let's just purchase technology X and just deploy it without a lot of thought. Adaptable leadership is, again, iterative, testing it out. We fail fast many times as you we were doing this, but we finally figured out the secret sauce. And again, we continue to iterate and, and, and absorb, as Daniel is saying, the most phenomenal experience for me. And this was, you know, we were skeptical that this would work. And actually seniors, as Daniel was saying, I attended a a session where, where everyone was doing yoga online while they were logged in. Yeah. Pretty phenomenal, I think. Yeah, yeah. So what, wondering how you uh, kind of deal with uh, uh, the sort of language issue, right? I mean, there's, there's probably hundreds of languages and dialects that are, that are out there in the immigrant community. And so with something like Gateway, I mean, are, are you trying to provide it in different languages or is there an auto translator or like, like, how do you, how do you uh, deal with that? Uh, through three things. We've got Gateway will be translated in multiple languages. And Daniel, I think we're talking about 10 to start, correct? And then moving into higher and higher. So that's number one. Number two is we've got 113 heroes that work for Team ISC. And they come from more than 100 countries. And sometimes we hire them. Everyone is hired based on merit, but sometimes there's a strategic hire to represent a community because we have noticed that in our research that first language planning in the newcomers 
first language of choice creates a level of trust and friendship and sense of belonging higher than a, you know, a traditional planner. Mm -hmm. And then the, the third piece on that is we have an internal social enterprise called the Interpretation and Translation Center. And we can translate and do interpretations in more than 100 languages. What's really amazing about that innovation, I think maybe if you're doing a tech meetup on social enterprise, we would love to come back again and give you a little bit of the, right. some of the lessons we learned there. But what we're doing is we're now, we now have 20 plus corporate partners. We bring in the revenue. We are also partially funded, but we're providing translations and interpretations pro bono to the vulnerable groups because now we're providing enough revenue. So uh, just recently, actually, we rehired a, um, a newcomer on our team because in the pandemic, when the, you know, some of the funding was cut because of the social enterprise revenue, we were able to create a job. I know it's a small thing, but I mean, I, I think you should see that person's LinkedIn post and what she's saying yeah. about Immigrant Services Calgary. It's become viral, actually, that she's been welcomed back. Very cool. That's, that's, that's great. So in terms of, uh, you know, kind of linkages you might already have into kind of the tech ecosystem in Calgary, uh, are, do you have some of those connections and what are they? And, and then uh, how do you facilitate some of those conversations? Yep. In the early days of my role, I definitely went around in my stakeholder engagements and I had the pleasure of speaking to Rainforest. I went to Benevity and a few hackathons. I went to the University of Calgary's Haskane School of Business hackathon. So there's a couple of things that we did, but because of capacity issues to get Gateway launched and uh, again, doing it with like limited resources, believe it or not, all of this is happening under a $10 million budget. And Gateway itself is only a $1.5 million budget per year. And so we are, you know, we're currently working with corporate uh, sponsors to fill the gaps that we can get this transformation done. So now that I have capacity now with, with the first phase completed, I, I will be looking forward to your assistance to invite us to tables where you think that, you know, we could add value and, and learn from each other. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I mean, so both uh, both uh, Data for Good and Civic Tech Calgary, we are um, community partners at the new platform um, innovation center that's that's developing, which is really cool. So it'll be open in uh, uh, 2021, sometime next year, and it, we are really building a community of you know of uh, tech engaged uh, people. So we'll you know we'll be happy to uh, spread the word and continue to uh, uh, look for volunteers because of the amazing work that uh, that you guys are doing. So you've got good news to share, Jeff, is Dr. Terry Rock, who's the leader of the organization Platform Calgary. He signed up to be part of the Gateway project because he thinks that we can onboard tech entrepreneurs quicker through yeah. Gateway as well. Yeah. So that's a collaboration. We have a letter of support from, from him. So we're grateful for that. So we once they open up, I think we'll have to figure out how we go about it. So again, that's another linkage to, to your, to your group. Right. right. Yeah. So, I mean, the, you know, the Calgary tech ecosystem is really uh, developing and is really a growth, uh, really a growth area. So it's uh, great when all this comes together. So I think we'll, we'll sort of stop at this point and, and uh, you know, thank you again for uh, the amazing uh, work that you're doing in the, uh, in the immigrant uh, settlement area and, and Gateway is just an amazing tool that's going to provide a huge amount of value to, uh, to Canadian society. Um, so a reminder, if you want to um, uh, volunteer with uh, Immigrant Services Calgary uh, through Data for Good and Civic Tech, uh, send me a, a meetup message with your contact information and uh, we'll put a little uh, project team together. Um, a reminder that this recording will be available uh, as well as the presentation deck and the video links will be available on the, uh, the meetup sites in the comments section um, in, the, uh, in the next day or two. So with that, uh, we'll, uh, we'll bid you good night and uh, take care. And uh, again, thanks so much for a, a great presentation. Thanks everyone. Really appreciate Thank you listening online.